Number one. I used to work night shifts as a security guard at a department store. It was pretty boring work, but hey, it paid the bills. Rarely did anything out of the ordinary happen. A few young dumbasses messing around and causing trouble was about as interesting as the job got. There was one incident, however, which I'll never be able to forget. I'd been working at the store for a few years. A new guy started working alongside me, called Sonny. Let me tell you, he definitely had the right name. He was always really happy and upbeat. I don't want to say I was training him, more like showing him the ropes. We got on pretty well, since we were in a similar age bracket. He only looked to be a few years younger than me, probably around 35 or so. I can't be more precise than that. I only knew the guy for a week. We were both on shift together late one night. We had just finished having a midnight snack and a coffee break, when something caught my attention on the CCTV monitor. It looked like a couple of drunk troublemakers outside the building, looking in through the window. They showed no signs of moving on, and it's best to nip this kind of thing in the bud. So I patted Sunny on the shoulder and we started making our way to the pair of bozos outside. Sonny and I talked normally on the way over. The prospect of having to deal with two drunkards didn't faze either of us. We were both big guys, and we knew what we signed up for with this job. He told me that although the work hours weren't ideal, he was enjoying the job all the same. Huh, that's good. Sonny was a nice guy, and I was glad that he planned on sticking around. Anyway... We get outside and tell the two guys to move along. Thankfully, they oblige without any trouble. They stumble off down the street, singing a slurred song as they went. Sonny and I shared a laugh at their expense. We start heading back to our monitor station to finish off our coffee. Remembering that there were still a couple of snacks left, Sonny jokingly ran ahead of me, pretending to be worried that I'd eat the whole lot if I got there before him. He jogged about 15 meters in front of me, then tripped. He made that little <gasps> noise as he fell, and then he was gone. As he hit the floor, he just wasn't there anymore. He disappeared right in front of me. I shout out for him, but there's no reply. At first, I think it's a prank, but then I start to worry. If it was a joke, it was massively elaborate. Panicking a little, and not knowing what else to do, I head back to our station. The first thing I did was check the CCTV. There, on the grainy monitor, it showed Sunny disappearing. I didn't have authority to take the tapes home with me, so I had to wait until the next day to show anybody the footage. Everyone who saw it was initially as freaked out as I was, but they all quickly rationalized it. The cameras must have been faulty and cut out some frames. Sonny didn't come into work that night. I tried calling the guy on his cell phone. Every time I tried, the number was engaged. Sonny never came back into work. My boss said that he'd received a call from him. Apparently, he said that the job just wasn't for him, and that he'd decided to move on. Everyone started looking at me weird because I kept bringing the incident up and wouldn't let the whole thing go. I felt like I was going crazy. Was there something I was missing that these guys weren't? The freakiest thing was what happened a week after his disappearance. While working the night shift alone, I received a call on the work phone. Strange, I thought. In all the years I'd worked that job, I could count the number of calls I received on the work phone on one hand. It was an unknown number. I answered the call. On the other end of the line, there was just static. A voice was mixed in amongst it, but whatever the person was saying, it was indecipherable. I know it sounds weird, but I can't help but think that that call was from Sonny. From wherever he was. I told my other co-workers about the call. They all basically said, freaky but obviously didn't make as big a deal of it as me. I stopped bringing Sonny up in conversation after that. It was obvious they didn't want to keep hearing about him. They hardly knew the guy after all. Anyway, I just wanted to share this story. It's all these years later now, 
and I don't think too much about it anymore. Still, if anyone ever brings up the paranormal, or asks if I have a bizarre story from my time working night shifts, I always think of Sunny, and where he is now. Number 2 In hindsight, this whole thing might sound a little bizarre to most people, maybe even a little comical, but believe me when I tell you that, at the time, it was the scariest thing I'd ever experienced. Before I begin, a little backstory. I'm an American that used to live in China, despite the fact I couldn't speak or understand more than a few words in Mandarin. I was living with my girlfriend out there at the time, and needed to find a way to make some cash. Seeing as my vocabulary was limited to where's the bathroom, and I'll have another beer please, I figured I was shit out of luck. In the end though, a friend of mine out there managed to bag me a pretty sweet gig. In China, they have a lot of western knockoffs. iPhone clones, designer clothing ripoffs, stolen car designs, etc. They're all made way cheaper, and it usually shows. But this sort of stuff is everywhere. The place where my friend landed me a job was actually a counterfeit version of Disneyland, a small theme park that was catering to the ever-growing middle class in China. It didn't go by the name Disneyland, of course, but the whole magical aesthetic had been borrowed, so to speak. In fact, the only real difference was that everything was a lot scruffier and cheaper looking. They had people in circle-eared mouse costumes parading around the park, a guy who dressed up as a duck in a sailor's outfit, and I swear one of the entertainers was literally just Buzz Lightyear. They gave them different names to their American counterparts, for example, Crazy Mouse instead of Mickey Mouse, but you get the point. The whole thing was really shameless, but at that point in time, a job was a job, and yeah, my job was to dress up as one of these characters and entertain the kids. The character I was set to play was a tall dog with long, black, floppy ears, a yellow jacket, and a tiny hat. Yup, I was literally bootleg goofy. The kids seemed to know the character well enough, and would always come running up to me shouting the character's Chinese name. It didn't matter to them that the costume I was wearing was tattered and discoloured. To them, this place was still magical. Thankfully, none of the costumed performers were allowed to talk to the visitors. We could only communicate through gestures. As such, my lack of Chinese wasn't so much of a problem. I was also lucky in a sense that Goofy's known for being quite dumb, so when I didn't react properly to whatever one of the kids said, it didn't seem so out of character. I was working the night shift at the park at the time. There was a special event going on to celebrate the upcoming New Year and we were staying open a lot later than usual to build up buzz and put on some late night shows and attractions. I was doing my usual thing, namely waddling around the park, boiling to death in my goofy soup prison, and trying to put a smile on all the kids' faces by being stupid. This might sound like an easy job to you guys, and in terms of being mentally challenging, you'd be right. Physically though, it could get a little rough at times. The sun might have gone down that night, but it was particularly hot. Seriously, it felt like I was six inches from the sun inside that damn suit. I had to take a break, so I made my way to a nearby rec room, one of the few spots in the park where we're authorized to take off our costumes. I get inside and immediately take off my giant character head. As I'm sitting there, relaxing, another one of my co-workers enters the room. They're in their costume, but immediately, I know who it is because of the outfit they're wearing. It's a guy I called Sean. There was only one costume for each character at the park to avoid the kids ever spotting two of the same guy next to each other. That sort of thing ruins the illusion. Sean was hired to play this giant, anthropomorphic orange cat with a big grin plastered on its face. I have no idea who this character was supposed to be. Maybe one of the park's own creations. There he was, just standing in the rec room doorway in all his feline glory. He was one of the few co-workers I had that spoke good English. I looked up at him and said, 
Hey, how's the night going? He doesn't respond to me. In fact, he doesn't really move at all. He's just standing motionless in the doorway, looking right at me through the eye holes of his costume. You're not hot in there, buddy? You can take your head off. Things go uncomfortably silent. All I can hear are these heavy breaths coming from inside Sean's suit. The kind of breathing you hear from people in a deep rage or something. Sean? You okay in there? I ask him. That's when I notice it. In his gloved hands, he's holding something. It's a hammer. I'm starting to feel a little worried now, nervous about what's going on inside this guy's head. He bursts out into this verbal tirade in Chinese. I could only understand a few of the words, but one of them stood out. Laowai. Foreigner. He's pointing the hammer at me as he's speaking. Whatever he's saying, he's furious. All I'm thinking about is how to defend myself against this guy if he comes at me swinging. Step by step, he's inching closer, waving the hammer about like a fanatic. I can't get past him through the main door. My only other option is the door to the hallway behind me. It leads to another room which has access to the outside. Problem was, half the time the door was locked. If there wasn't another member of staff in there already, I'd be running into a dead end. If that was the case, then I'd be screwed. I decided to take my chances. What other choice did I have? I leapt up from my seat and made for the hallway. Sprinting down it, I could hear Sean's footsteps behind me. He was screaming in Chinese, though I couldn't tell you what. All I can tell is that he's hot on my heels. As I reach for the handle to the potentially locked door, I say a small prayer to myself. Please God, let this thing be open. I twist the handle, and the door gives way. There was indeed someone else in the room. I have no idea who he was, and he didn't seem to understand me as I tried to explain in English what was going on. Holding the door closed proved to be pointless. Sean slammed his way into the room, still holding the hammer. I made like a madman for the exit, hoping to lose him in the crowd of the park. I could hear the other employee trying to calm him down in Chinese. At least, that's what I assume he was doing. Thankfully, as I made my way through the park, the guy didn't pursue me any further. I informed my superior, and an investigation began. A few things came to light after that. Firstly, Sean wasn't working at the park that night. He wasn't even in the province. He'd gone back to see his family for New Year celebrations. The suits are left in lockers at the park, so whoever was wearing the costume had somehow got access to staff quarters, and very deliberately made a point to target me personally. It also turned out that one of the on-site constructors had a hammer missing from his toolkit. This whole thing had been planned out. The other park worker who tried to calm the attacker down wasn't so successful. He ended up with a broken wrist after struggling with the guy for the hammer. Sadly, nothing ever came of the case. I guess the whole thing just sounded too ridiculous to take seriously. Besides, the cops weren't interested in hunting down some random guy that threatened a Laowai at a theme park. Ultimately, I'll never learn who was behind the mask, or why the hell they tried to threaten me. Nor will I know if they planned to take things further had my co-worker not been in that room. I ended up losing my job for running headless through the park. That didn't matter. I was going to quit anyway. Despite the whole magical facade going on there, I no longer felt welcome. Not being able to find any other work, I ended up breaking things off with my girlfriend and moving back to the States. I'm now married with two young children and they both keep asking to go to Disneyland. If I see a guy in a goofy suit walking around over there, I'll be sure to shake his giant, gloved hand. Those guys don't get enough credit. Number 3 I'm still not totally sure whether I should be sharing this story or not, 
but it's been five years since this incident, and I'm sure the guys involved have probably forgotten all about me by now, so I'm gonna risk it. I was working night shifts at a factory in small town Russia, a little place right on the coast. Let me tell you, night shifts are the worst. If you're not in a position where you literally have to do a nighttime job, then trust me, don't. It puts a real strain on your social and romantic life. This one night, I was on duty with a fellow employee I had become friends with. His name was Vassal. He was a really cool guy, kept to himself mostly, but was friendly, and always, always had a smile on his face. If you ever needed a hand with something, he was the first to volunteer. If you were having car troubles, Vassal would go out of his way to give you a ride to and from work. You never would have thought that he was the kind of guy to get mixed up in the sordid world of the Russian Mafia. Anyway, for about two weeks leading up to this, Vassal really wasn't acting like himself. He was down in the dumps and hardly spoke a word to anyone. When I asked what the matter was, he mentioned to me that he needed some extra cash. He never told me what for, mind you, just said that he really needed it. My reply to him was that this was the night shift. Everyone here was desperately in need of money. That's why we were working this crappy job in the first place. He laughed and nodded, but I could see in his eyes that he was disappointed. I guess he was hoping I might loan him some cash. Sadly, I couldn't. On the night this happened, the pair of us were working together. Vassal seemed in high spirits again. I figured things had turned out well for the guy financially. Maybe one of his relatives had offered to lend him some money. I was glad that things were looking up for him, and said that we should have a drink on the weekend to toast to his health. Halfway through our shift, a jeep pulled up outside the factory. Four very large men dressed in black got out and rushed into the building. Vassal must have recognized at least one of them, because he quietly muttered, Shit, to himself. They rapidly approached him. One of them slammed his head against one of the machines, and with the help of another, dragged Vassal out to the jeep and tossed him in the back. One of the other men told us not to contact the cops or talk about what just happened, said that they needed to talk to Vassal alone and that it wasn't any of our business. He said that they would come back for all of us if any one of us spoke out. Then, once all of the men were in the jeep, they drove off with old Vassal, and I never saw the guy again. I'm ashamed to say that I was so terrified I didn't contact the police. None of us at the factory did. When his family contacted the authorities to say that he'd gone missing, the cops acted like they didn't care at all and said that there wasn't much they could do. They must have been as scared of these guys as we were. About a week after that night, a refrigerator was hauled from the ocean. There was a chain around the door, keeping it locked tight. When the chain was cut open, seawater came pouring out. Inside the fridge was Vassal. His body was bloated and decomposed. The salt water in his lungs suggested that he had been dumped overboard while still alive. The poor guy must have been really desperate for money. In the end, I guess he got involved with the wrong people, and either tried to hustle them, or just screwed up so badly in their eyes that he had to be taken care of. His wife and kids disappeared not long after. I hope by choice. Number 4 I did my basic military training at Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri. Our barracks were old, dating to around the 1950s or 60s. Every night, a number of recruits were assigned fire guard duty, which was essentially trying to stay awake for an hour mopping the floor or buffering it until the next soldier came on duty. The fire guard post for my platoon was at one end of a long hallway, directly under a set of speakers suspended from the ceiling. Whenever the drill sergeants made an announcement, you would hear them through those speakers. When they had to talk to the whole building at once, that was how they communicated with us. Usually, these were communicated in blistering shouts, 
rendered staticky and nearly unintelligible as they blared through the ancient sound system. One night, about halfway through basic, I was sitting in a chair under those speakers, trying to stay awake. The speakers crackled to life, and I immediately perked up. Unusual for an announcement this time of night, but it wasn't outside the realm of possibility. The voice was soft, barely above a whisper. It was a woman's voice. Private, get everyone outside, right now. The comm line remained open, a low hum hissing through. The voice again. Right now, Private, everyone outside. Weird. Not that it was a woman's voice. It was a co-ed basic training, and we had a couple of female drills. But for it to come across so softly was very strange. When the brown rounds used the intercom, it was at full, shouting voice. I headed down the length of the hall to where second platoon had a fire guard on duty. He was similarly situated. I asked him if he heard anything. Got a negative response. I made a decision. I'd chalk it up to my imagination and tiredness, and not risk having the entire barracks furious at me for disturbing their sleep in error. At least I'd be the only one who got smoked. Nothing happened the rest of the night, and I put it out of my mind until the very end of basic, when we had our three-day field training exercise. We made it through, and the drill started treating us like real human beings again. Well, almost. As we completed the last day of the exercise, we all gathered around the fire. The drills got to talking, then got to telling stories, then got to telling ghost stories about the base. My drill, Parida, a male, told the story of the first female drill sergeant at Fort Leonard Wood. Can't remember when it was, the 70s or the 80s, but it was decades ago. As you can probably imagine, she faced a lot of pressure and harassment. It was unrelenting and harsh, and apparently she couldn't take it. She had hung herself from some exposed water pipes using her belt. A few years later, they'd plastered over the exposed pipes so that they could mount speakers there. Hi guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. So it's kind of been a while since the last video, I know, I know, sorry. But I have been quite busy recently, and uh, now I am getting back on track, I'm back from Berlin. That was a very nice holiday, so uh, who knows where the next stop will be, but um, hopefully I won't be going on holiday anytime soon so I can pump out some more videos. Especially since Halloween's coming up, and I do have a sort of special planned. Hopefully you guys will like that one, uh, keep your eyes peeled. And if you enjoyed this video, then be sure to smash that like button, or you guessed it, I'll smash you. Until the next one, guys. You all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.